really disgusting. I'm like so sure of like, mark me out. Yeah. It is nine minutes before nine. Teenage girls often seem to have their own language, and what you've just heard is, is one version of it. That was rock star Frank Zappa and his 14-year-old daughter, Moon Unit, on the hit record Valley Girl. Now, the song parodies the lingo of girls in California's San Fernando Valley. But what began as a spoof has kind of become a teenage craze. Kids everywhere are starting to talk and dress like the Valley Girls. Frank and Moon Zappa are in our ABC studio in Los Angeles to tell us about this trend. And good morning to both of you. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'll start with you, Moon, because you go to school in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, Want to tell us what a, a Valley Girl is really like? Uh, you don't want to know. <laughs> Why? Sure, they, they want to know. <laughs> Uh, well, oh, let's see. Me. What's a valley girl like? A valley girl is, um, like, oh, my God! How's that? <laughs> okay. Well, what is she like in, in her values, her mannerisms, the way she acts? I mean, you're with these people every day. Yeah, it's kind of hard to communicate with them. They're sort of, um, on another planet. Uh, gee, I, I can't really, uh, describe what they're like. Well, what are the values? Their values, uh, each person. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Check. Hi, everyone. We have a totally tubular episode this week, oh you my guys. God. Um, but in case you're wondering if Valley Girl was based on a book, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. The thing is, when the pandemic started, well, so many, so many years ago now, we committed to doing a brand new episode every single week. And so that meant we had to expand what we mean by book. So we really will consider any movie that's been um, adapted from any literary source whatsoever. And it could be a play. It could be a song. It could be a play and a song, as in today's movie. Or it could be a magazine article, a short story, and a novella. Or it could actually be, you know, a book. So this week we're going to be talking about Valley Girl, which is based both on the song by Frank Zappa and also loosely-ish, um, except it has a happy ending on uh, Romeo and Juliet. I just I would throw in too that there's there's a lot there's several graduate references yes going on here as well we'll talk about that in a moment but before we do if you have suggestions for movies uh movie adaptations that you would like for us to cover we would love to know about them and there's a few places where you can make those suggestions meet other listeners of this podcast and interact with us on the internet we do have a basic facebook page and the episodes are posted there we're much more interactive in our private Facebook group, and it's just a group where people talk about books and movies and a little bit of pop culture and old-time movie stars. So you type in book VS movie podcast group, ask to join, and then we have two posts there. One is – all of, both of them are actually – pretty substantive i mean one is the list of the shows we've already covered books and movies and songs and things like that and the other one's just a list of ideas we just ask that whatever the source is it should be pre pretty easy for us to get our hands on and the movie needs to be streaming on a major app we're very lucky because our movie today is streaming on amazon right now but in, also at a bunch of other places for free on twitter as long as that exists at book versus a movie we'll look into threads like we have to look into everything, um, Instagram, book versus movie, spell that all out. We have an old timey email, excuse me. It's book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. I have to admit, I signed up uh, yesterday. I was like, I'm too scared to do anything. I did the <laughs> so same this week. Yeah, it. we're dating the show because it <laughs> happened this very week, but like 30 million. It's just in the U.S. right now, I think. that's so. I Is think, that true? I okay. think so. So I think Twitter, I mean, all those places. Yeah. Yes. Please send us your ideas <sighs> and your suggestions. Yes. we Yeah. Because billionaires. Anyway. Because <laughs> it's like, right, it's Zuck, Zuckerberg versus Musk yes. versus Jack, what's his name, that ran Twitter who's doing Blue Sky next that nobody can get an invite except the cool kids. It's, it's life never changes. We're talking about cool kids and not cool kids. Right? I know. Seriously. I don't know where to begin with this one because the, the movie is – well, just to say the movie is genuinely based on the song. The song is not – one of the things about this movie is the soundtrack. It's like a legendary soundtrack. But the song Valley Girl is not on the soundtrack uh, because – 
Mr. Zappa was not interested in being involved in this film. <laughs> they went to him, right? But he was like, nah. And so they were like, well, we don't need you to make this Valley Girl. But this song is a humongous influence on the production. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We should talk about our Patreon. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, please keep us in books and movies. Yes. Support us on Patreon. Yes, so we have, we've been doing the show for almost 10 years. It's going to be 10 years in 2024. We have so many episodes that are on our Patreon wall. We're putting up, uh, right this summer will be Psycho and Silence of the Lambs. There's been so many others that we've put up there. It's everything from 2020 and then previous to that. So you just go to PAT, R-E-O-N, we have a a couple of very affordable options and it really just helps us get books and movies but if money is tight we totally understand we just say please you know wherever you get your podcast if you can leave us a review that'd be great or seriously just tell a friend about the show or if you'd like stickers we have some stickers drop us your address in an email and we will send them to you this episode is also sponsored, buddy. We want to say thank you to Baker Publishing Group. We have a novel with every memory by author Janine Roche. At its heart, with every memory is a story of what happens when an already broken family loses the one person holding them together. Lori Mendenhall returns home to a family she barely recognizes after the same car accident that killed her sons stole the last eight years of her memory. Lori's once loving husband is a stoic workaholic with questionable intentions, and her teenage daughter has been chewed up and spit out by the world following the loss of her twin brother. So as Lori goes through good and bad memories, as they resurface, she has to decide whether the family she's returning to is beyond hope. And the author did extensive research on trauma, how families can build back together. She's a very popular author, and we're really excited to promote her book. So once again, that's with every memory, Janine Roche, and that's the Baker Publishing Group. And we do have the link in our page and on in the show notes. So just swipe the artwork and you should get right to it. It sounds like a really good summer read. Yes. Yes. Like yes, a yes. good poolside kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is, it's heating up, y'all. <laughs> Think, oh, well, okay. We, uh, I'm so excited to talk about this movie, but we must talk about Frank Zappa. Yes. Um, he, he died really quite young, but he put out I, I, 60 albums, something like that. And right? there's been 30 Such since a prolific he died. Artist. Yes. I don't know if you saw the documentary. It's on Hulu right now. It's directed by no, Alex Winter, yet. who was in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. He's, he was Ted. No, he's Bill. Sorry, I get them mixed up. But he directed a, a biography about Frank Zappa. We sh Frank Zappa is one of those people, like, the fans of Frank Zappa, y'all are a very persnickety bunch. You know your stuff. <laughs> he was a genius. He was technically brilliant in every single way and he has so much music that's out there this movie the documentary i totally recommend if you get your hands on it, it's just called zappa he had his own library of his work and it just went decades i mean he started as a teenager he loved to edit film he'd take his family movies and inter he yeah other stuff. he a his multimedia his, artist i would say indeed oh absolutely he was um and such a sense of humor mm -hmm. and such a, a champion of um artistic expression and free speech i always think of him talking to congress you know his father was a chemist they moved around a lot so i think i think he kind of worked in the defense industry a little bit and when Frank was a teenager, they settled down in San Diego and they lived. This is an interesting little crossover because we were talking last week about one of the things that made Valley Girl the song and then Valley Girl the movie kind of ripe for the culture was Fast Times. Right. Uh, the movie Fast Times of Richmond High by uh, Cameron Crowe. Frank Zappa, when he was a teenager, his family moved around a lot. But when he was in high school, they settled down in Claremont, which is the neighborhood that Fast Times is based on. Um, that's Claremont High School is where Cameron Crowe pretended to be a student and kind of embedded himself. And that's the, the school that he, uh, although Frank Zappa went to Mission Bay High School, which is the other high school in that area. Um, and that was where he started playing 
in um in school bands and stuff like that oh i didn't know that he was in san diego mm-hmm. oh wow yeah, yeah i just learned that this week i never knew it either we should say sorry that it's also based on romeo and juliet but we went much more deep into romeo and juliet when we talked about the musical uh, west side story which is oh yes and i think it's in 2021 that we did it it's definitely in our free uh feed in our basic feed so definitely check that out but Look, it's, yeah, we're not going to talk about Shakespeare. We're not going to talk about Shakespeare and Romeo. <laughs> Look, it's been it's the theme of so many because people say, "Oh, it's a Romeo and Juliet story." I'm like, everything's kind of a Romeo and Juliet story. This is Romeo and Juliet without the kids dying, which is nice. But we really, yeah. I, I, when you brought up, we should cover this. I was like, well, it's not. You know, Zappa didn't sign the rights to this, and he was a perfectionist. This is a person who did not tolerate fools. There's a very famous, I don't know if you remember this, but when MTV first started, they had these Friday night concerts and he had a Friday night. It was like Halloween and Nina Blackwood was trying to interview him, her, she was trying to interview him, sorry. And he was so rough on her, just destroy. And she admits it. Like, I didn't have my chops. I didn't have. Yeah. And he just, he, she did not prepare. No. One thing, uh, there's a there's huge excitement involved in any Zappa concert, but tonight in particular, uh, bringing together the, uh, the the live broadcasting capabilities of uh, MTV and Starfleet, that's history. That is history, and we're real glad to be a part of it, Starfleet and MTV. What kind of very, very weird things might have happened in Halloweens of past tenses? And well, things like that. I'm interested in that. You know, before we started doing shows at the Palladium, we were doing some shows at the uh, Felt Forum. And there was the historic night when we gave one of the premieres of that song, that famous song, The Legend of the Illinois Enema Bandit, when we actually had some participation from the audience. And the girl who we brought up happened to be a radiologist assistant and knew how to do it. Only I didn't know that when I brought her up. And it was really excellent <laughs> entertainment. So what uh, else is new, Nina? Yeah. Well, uh... Gosh, not that much. I'd rather hear what you have to tell, actually. This is the first live simulcast in the history of cable broadcasting. Ah, yes, that's right. It is. It actually is. And he was not someone, like I said, to suffer fools. He was very intelligent, and he just, if he gave you a couple of chances, and that was about it. And so if he was going to do a movie, he would want to control it. He would want to control the script and the casting and all the music and everything. No one's going to give you that because we should say he was very, very popular. They were also part of that whole scene in the Valley of the people from Northern California moved to Southern California. Uh, I'm thinking of like Joni Mitchell and Crosby, Stills Mm -hmm. and Nash and like, and like, and like prog rock yes. and um yeah and he had some early success in the 1960s so he, i mean he just had a for somebody who had such a short life he had a very long career right and i he, guess is what i'm saying and he was doing uh like uh symphonies when he died when he passed oh, away seriously yeah, yeah for real so he was um, and he also was doing yeah. um international relations he was doing work in Prague, <laughs> like again, having them i mean it's yeah he was he has his worshipers and we're just saying there's no way we could reduce him to one episode and do it properly no. <laughs> so we're just no. admitting that like we're trying to be we're yeah. just, we just go for the high level stuff but i would totally recommend if you're interested in him you should definitely check that out the story for today is that he had four kids i believe it's four and yes yeah, his second wife he had four children right oh can we remember their names oh they're right moon here unit. um moon unit dweezel ahmed and diva dweezel and ahmed had a band remember they had and a moon show unit, too and they had a show and moon moon sang a at least one of their songs she's a good singer actually yeah. she doesn't sing this song she's speaking it but her singing voice is actually very nice, I think. Yeah, super talented family. Very, very talented right. family. Yeah, so he married Gail Slopeman. That was his second wife. And they had a very, by, we should say also, Moon has a book coming out next right. year, early next year. Um, and their, you know, Hollywood at that time was quite, we've talked about it before, I forget, the numerous movies, quite a debauched <laughs> yes. place. Um, lots of drugs, lots of sex, lots groupies. of like just group, yeah, groupies and um, not a lot of parental supervision <laughs> right. going on. Um, it was a little, it was a little crazy. Um, 
And if I remember correctly, Moon, I don't know how all the kids, but I, I was watching this interview with her and she was talking about how they put her in this school, like a private school, I think, or something like that. But she was with these kind of, she was going to school with these Valley, uh, Valley girls who were um, upper middle class. Yeah, it was, it's it definitely, and it still is kind of a culture, you know, it's Los Angeles is such a big sprawling place. It's massive. You all, if you never been, um, it's that's the thing about LA, like New York city, it's all dense and packed together mm -hmm. and vertical and up into the sky. Los Angeles is just spread out over such a massive area of land. And each little community is its own culture has its own slang. Even today, its own kind of things that are popular with the kids can be totally different from one neighborhood to another. Moon was saying was that her, you know, and her dad was super famous by then. He was traveling the globe. Her parents had kind of a bumpy relationship, very long, but, you know, there was, you know, it was very long enough, but, you know, and in that environment, there was some stuff that happened. She said that, you know, he would be gone all the time. And then when he was home, he would be in his studio all the time. And so she never, they never got to see their dad or spend a tremendous amount of quality time with their dad, um, especially like when they were in school. Right. And so one day she, she wrote him a note, I mean, just to give you an indication, like, she wrote him a note, like in her own house, he's in the house, you know, she, she wrote him a note saying like, well, if you, you know, if the only way to see you is in the studio, maybe we should work on something together, something, something to that effect and slipped it under the door. And then, um, I forget how, like sometime afterwards, like just a knock, like late at night or something. He's like, let's go, let's go do this thing. And they worked on this amazing, uh, groundbreaking, cultural it's, moments i has to like so margo grew up in southern california in 1982 i was living in pennsylvania near where qvc is now but when i was there there was no qvc it was just cow pastures it was a hick town she said it was two in the morning her dad woke her up and said i have this idea for a riff why don't you do that talk thing that you're telling me about the girls at school so she started doing that because she missed him she wanted to hang out with him they you know he was he said you would come home if he wasn't in the studio he was sleeping and then they had to all be quiet so it was just like this presence that he had so she came up with this the valley girl thing and so like margo says because they also will talk about good morning america that interview i've sent you earlier that interview is like next level <laughs> so much going on in we point. should say she's 14 she's a kid. she is 14 years old right my son is 14 years old i would you try to put my son on a show like solid gold like you have to get through me first yeah i cannot believe what this poor young woman had to do it's pretty incredible so once again frank zabba never had a top 40 hit he was on saturday night live and he hated it like he's just he's like a very temperamental person and he's not one to go with the mass culture. That's not his interest at all. But they have this hit. She loved K-Rock, which is a station that was in L.A. I don't know if it's still going, but she gives them an acetate of this song and says, you need to play the song. I think people will like it. And it blew up. And then it started playing across the... Because they didn't have a big distribution at the time. Either. Then they had to make these copies and they send them all across the country. And I'm telling you, as a little kid in Pennsylvania... I totally got it. I loved it. And then all my friends were talking like it. And then they were doing promotion for it. So they went, she went on Solid Gold. They went on Letterman together for like a 10 minute segment. Once again, Frank Zappa's a legend. And he's doing interviews with this 14 year old about her song for a right. thing he doesn't really. Uncool. It was very uncool to him. And I'm sure he was like, where's my hit record? Like, for me. So then they do an interview and I put it in the Facebook group and I posted it on TikTok that Moon and him are doing a Good Morning America interview and it's 5:30 in the morning where they are. Ugh. It's lots are lots is going on cuz like Joan is like, "Hey, so how does it feel?" and she's 14. She's like, "I, I don't know, whatever." And then she's asking Frank and he's like, "Well, mm. and it's just this bizarre circumstance. In the meantime, Hollywood is like trying to make all these teen movies because Fast Times does really well. There was Porky's before that. So like mm -hmm. teen movies, teen movies. So like 
I hear Valley Girl's popular. Let's make a Valley Girl movie. They go to Frank Zappa, and I'm sure he, I'm sure he wanted so much, and they were like, we got to write this in like two weeks and then film it. We have no time. Seriously. And that's what yeah. they basically did. So Frank did sue later, so we should say technically. They did not approve this. They didn't get paid for it. This is just Hollywood taking a thing and making a thing. This is why people trademark everything. You wonder why people trademark up to the their teeth and everything, expressions and everything. This is why. Anyway, this is when we they create this movie, and it's Martha Coolidge, and she had directed documentaries before this. Mm-hmm. She's she, very cool. Very um, cool. She did uh, that movie Rambling Rose with Laura Dern. You remember that? And that Real Genius. I don't know how, I don't remember how the story that she got onto this project, but um, as Margot said, it was written really quickly because they were like, you know, we've got to strike while the iron's hot. We don't have time to wait around for Frank Zappa. With or without you, we're making this movie. And the fact of the matter is, you know, in terms of like examining it for this show and other, and in terms of its place in the culture, there's no way on earth this movie would have ever happened right. without that song. Right. It would not exist. The kids, I'm going to just call them kids, the kids in the cast all say that working on the film and prepping the film, the producers gave them Valley Girl to listen to and study the dialect. It absolutely, I think, counts as an adaptation in this case. And then you have the overlay of the kind of star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet thing. I saw this amazing interview with Martha Coolidge and Nicolas Cage. Did you see that? No. It's recent. It's on like the 30th anniversary of the movie. It's. I'll find it and put it in our Facebook group. It is the sweetest thing because Nicolas Cage is at this point he's like a he's Nicholas Cage he's he's already like he's already dying his hair we'll just put it that way and um he is so like in awe of Martha Coolidge and like reverential of her and just like I can't believe you took a chance on me and I really appreciate it and you didn't know that I was a Coppola she didn't know that he was a Coppola right. and he just really really has such a um you, this the film is very important to him, and we'll talk about why in a minute. And she was so smart in – she was talking about the movie, and it's very clear that she was extremely deliberate about the decisions that she made in the movie, the way everybody is presented and, and the dialogue and all of that. And it's incredible to me because it is a movie that was put together so quickly. Like the, the studio just wanted to crank this thing out. And like we said, strike the, while the iron is hot. Let's just get this thing out there. And she was like, no, we're going to actually make a, movie. <laughs> a story, a story. And the reason why it works so well and holds up so well is really because you had this brilliant woman calling the shot. Yeah, she's really, she's really cool. I, I really admire her. Why don't we play the trailer and then we'll talk about this movie. Besides, it's totally gnarly birth control. I can't stand it. Okay, so he's awesome. <laughs> Valley Girl. She's out there somewhere. This is the story of a boy from Hollywood who never dreamed the girl he'd want most was down here. I'll stop the world. Hello. Hello. Who invited you? Oh, wow, uh, you mean you have to be invited? That explains it. What? Well, everyone is dressed for See, if I had been invited, I would have known this was a costume party. Right. <laughs> it's the story of a girl from the valley who never dreamed she'd ever be seen with a boy from over here. It's like I'm not getting out of this car. All right, but when they attack the car, save the radio. So when can I see you again? I'm here with you now. I know. This is the story of Randy and Julie, the way they come together, and the people who try to pull them apart. Like, don't you think they have parties over there? Oh, where? At the zoo? This geek that she's with could scar her for life. God, life? If you think she's confused, you should see her father. I'm together now. Be right there. Julie's cool. Randy's hot. 
She's from the valley. He's not. Valley girl. If you look at the poster for this movie, by the way, and people always bring this up, because I've always wondered too, I'm like, that's not Deborah Foreman in the poster with Nicolas Cage. It's another actress who has another role in the film. Either they hadn't cast her yet or that she wasn't available that day. It was a $350,000 budget. And they wrote this, like like I said, I think it was in 10 days. And they just had a few weeks to shoot it and then edit it. And then it was out the following April. Like they really fast tracked this thing. So they have Nicolas Cage, who's like 19 or 20 years old, Deborah Foreman. Their chemistry is ridiculous. It's so good. I'm it's so good. They're in it's love. so believable. They're in love. Yeah, Deborah Foreman now is known as kind of a screen, a scream queen. Mm -hmm. She's a she does a lot of horror stuff and she's a huge following like for that. She's delightful in this. She's she was from Texas. This is really her first, you know, major role. She had an agent and she got the call to read for this. And they were looking at like Michelle Pfeiffer, who mm -hmm. was virtually unknown at the time, and who also would have been good. Michelle Pfeiffer, because she'd been in Greece too. Right. <laughs> I remember her agent told the studio like, oh, well, if you're going to cast her, you need to cast her now because she's going to go do this movie in France called something or other like Women in Love or something like that. And so they cast her, which and that was a total lie. Like, so she got cast on kind of a bluff. She's awesome, though. I think she's so good. And she talks about like she listened to that song over and over and over and over again because she didn't not only did she not have a valley girl accent she didn't even have a west coast accent because she was from texas like he's not so awesome awesome's not the word for brad oh i'm sure he's okay i guess yeah i'm kidding <laughs> yeah well, you know he makes my mouth water no! oh, oh my God. brad will be at my party tonight great that'll like attract every girl west of van nuys boulevard your place will be packed Okay, so he's awesome. <laughs> Julie, like, don't be so greedy. You know, save some for the rest of us. I mean, Tommy is such a hunk. I can't stand it. <laughs> I mean, he is so bitchin'. Like, I can't even believe you'd give Brad the time of day. Yeah, but Tommy could be such a dork, you know? Like, he's got the bod, but his brains are bad news. But he is bitchin'. You really are so lucky, Julie. I know, but we've been going together so long now. Like beginning to think I'm a piece of furniture or something like an old chair. <laughs> oh, bad news. <laughs> I definitely need something new. He got it. off at home in his speech, okay? Good. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds good. Julie, like, Julie, we won't really need to get ready to get ready to get ready to get ready Yes, we will. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mm. What a surprise finding you here. Well, where should I be? At home waiting for the phone to ring? I could grow old and prune up waiting for that to happen. Funny. What's your problem? What's my problem? Try two days and no phone call. Look, I'll see you guys at the bus, okay? Okay. That's okay. okay. It's like I'm totally not in love with you anymore, Tommy. I mean, it's so boring. Here. Not too cool, Julie. Like, I won't be bummed out. Who else is there? Oh, the Val dude can touch me. I mean, she must be really freaking out. Uh, we should also say that there's Michelle Mayrink, who was in, she would be in Revenge of the Nerds and also in Real Genius. She was kind of in a lot of nerdy, really big time nerdy movies. There's Elizabeth Daly who sometimes goes by E.G. Daly, who's the voice Baby of the Baby pig. the pig. La, la, la. <laughs> she does a ton of cartoon voices. She's adorable in this. She's in Better Off Dead. She was she in sings. one of the Pee Wee movies, right? Yes, she's the girlfriend Wasn't of the she... Pee Wee movies. Yeah. Yes, and she, or wannabe girlfriend. And she's also, yeah, she's she's done a ton of voice work. And we have Cameron Dye, who plays Nicolas Cage's best friend, Fred, who's just so cute, too. It's so well cast, this movie. Michael Bowen is the evil boyfriend who's like Tommy, who's like every blonde so bad guy. And I know. He's They're so terrible. These, these blonde, so... preppy, awful men that were in these movies as the bad guy. They're, he's he's like good. The, 
He's like the older brother of James Spader's character in Pretty in Pink. Yep. <laughs> it's like a William Zapka in there as well. There's like all those, those that trope of them. But the story, which is really pretty amazing, the parents are Colleen, um, Colleen Camp and Frederick Forrest. So, I mean, Colleen Camp was only like 10 years older than her too, but they... Yeah, yeah. But they have such a great because they were in Apocalypse Now together. They were they were longtime friends. But mm -hmm. they play they're the parents, and the dad is this former hippie, his current hippie. He has like his own like vegan shop. They have a like a macrobiotic store slash restaurant, which is so eighty three <laughs> basically. It's so LA. It's yeah. so LA. It's so eighty three, and so she's so. She's, her name is Julie and Julie has her friends and she goes to the Galleria and she shops and she has the accent. Oh, which we should say we, for, for people who don't yes, know, the please. Galleria was, I don't think it's open anymore. It's still there. The building is still there. Um, and there's still, you know, like a lot of these abandoned malls and flux oh, right so now. Sad. But but the Galleria, when the Galleria opened, was the premier mall of the United States. It was you know, the best architecture. It had everything. You never had to leave the Galleria. Parents would drop their kids off, you know, on Saturday morning and, and they would come home before dark. It And without ever leaving the Galleria, you'd go to the movies, you go shopping, you go get something to eat. Um, you would go talk by the fountain. You flirt with boys. <laughs> you would flirt with boys and, and, and you were in this sort of safe, sanitized um, environment. And that's how it was. Um, in California. And also we also in California, um, we always had a, like a, a lot of mall culture here, yes, I think I already going, going, going way back. But many of our malls at that time were uh, outdoor. Um, and the Galleria was an indoor cover mall. And that was one of the things that made it special because they could also control the climate. A joke that I never got until this week, as many times as I've seen this movie, and I love this movie so much. <laughs> Me too. There's a joke right at the beginning. I never got until this week. And the beginning of the movie is an aerial view, clearly from a helicopter. They're up in a helicopter, and the helicopter is going from Los Angeles proper to to over the over the little hill into the the, the valley, the San Fernando Valley. And the beginning is a radio station in Los Angeles, and it's like, hello, you know, here we are in K Rock, and in LA today, it's going to be, uh, it's like 73 degrees and da, 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 da. it's going to be a beautiful day. And then it kind of, cross, as you go over the hill, it cross fades into a valley um, radio station. And the valley radio station says, and, you know, KFLM in the valley. And today it's going to be a balmy 85 degrees, <laughs> something like that, because the valley is so much freaking hotter than the rest of Los Angeles. It, the it's surrounded by, you know, the hills that surround it just trap the heat and hold it in. And yeah, in this like 20 minutes it takes to get from any other part of Los Angeles into the valley, it is 10 degrees hotter, which I never noticed that joke before ever this week. And I was just cracking up. It was so funny. And I didn't get either in the that we, that we are crossing from Los Angeles. I had never really listened to it. I just like, oh, it's the radio. But I hadn't actually listened to what they were saying until this week. And I love it. It just, it's so smart. Yes. And it just, it's such a great, again, Martha Cool uh, Coolidge, it's just setting the tone of we're going to have this clash of cultures, you know, between the valley and like this encapsulated world of the valley, almost like Barbie right now right versus the real world of los angeles and then we're in the galleria and come on come on i miss mall life you know to be honest with you i went fun. i went to the mall today to get some equipment that we needed for the show and i was like oh yeah you can do everything here you could get all your needs in one place and take it home with you you don't have to wait for it i mean i know it's this whole different world so the valley is where these these kids hang out is at the mall. They're very pretty girls. They're, this is very white, by the way. We should say this is very suburban and oh, it sure is. It's it yeah. sure is. There's one black girl at the party. I don't see anybody there that looks like me, and I don't see any Asians. So yeah, and that was definitely like that culture that was being you know you remember 17 magazine uh, you know the the culture the teenage culture and all of the movies were, were so white such a white thing and that's just how it was i mean right. that's mtv was white and uh all the magazines when you went to the mall you know all of the ads were all 
white young people. And I think it captures it super well. Oh, and there's this other scene <laughs> where they're in the gallery. I mean, the, the Easter eggs in this movie, it's just so delightful. <laughs> like it just, she's so smart. Um, there, there's this scene where they're in the Galleria and the girls, it's right at the beginning of the, and the girls are coming down the escalator. And then on the other side, on the up escalator, is one of these women, we knew them in the 80s, they, every town had one, every community had one, the woman with the six feet of hair. <laughs> Remember the woman with the six feet of hair? I mean, we had we had them. And there's one, there she is, the woman with the six feet of hair, you know, going up the, going up the Galleria escalator. I mean, it was such an 80s moment. The girls are talking about, they're looking at guys, they're young, they're carefree. Julie, our, our main, our main character is talking about like, you know, I'm not really, I'm in this relationship with this Tommy. I don't, I'm not really getting anything out of it. It's super boring. And, and like, what are we doing? I don't even know. And the girl's like, are you kidding? He's so hot. You should, what are you, what are you talking about? It, you know, just he's the best. He's like everything we could possibly want. And when he shows up, like he is the man, he is the, he's like a Jordash ad. <laughs> it's also we should say preppy culture was like popular just before this oh yeah and definitely that was a big deal like that was satirized everywhere but yeah it's this very upper middle class white environment and that's what they're representing and so they go to a school with just every they're the most popular girls in the school the guys have the flipped collars the girls have the bandanas that you use as a belt and you use it like to put up your hair i mean it's just all this stuff like i was like oh my god i remember all of this i I loved every outfit. I always she wore, think by the way. that this is this is the look that Steve Bannon thinks he's pulling off. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's not. No. <laughs> he's not. I think I think I think Deborah Foreman looks beautiful in this movie. Her wardrobe. I mean the wardrobe. Amazing. The wardrobe choices. Perfection. Yeah. No notes. And they have and they had no budget so they were like borrowing clothes from people like this is and that's how it got that's why it feels real when you look at it like they just look like real kids so she's dating Tommy he's kind of a jerk but she doesn't you know she's not really shopping you know she doesn't know anybody there any other guys that kind of spark her interest and then they go to a party and at the party and I love it that Michelle Mayrink, she has, uh, is it Michelle? No, it's the other girl. I think it's Michelle. She's the one that has the stepmother that the father died. And so the stepmother's like only 30. And so she's flirting with these kids. It's so gross, but it's funny. It's so gross, but it is hilarious. Yeah. And that's the, she's, that's her subplot. That's the kind of um, little takeoff on like 80s version of The Graduate. Yeah, um, exactly. And she's, yeah, she's got this hot stepmom. And she's, but she also has a crush on this guy and the skippy. stepmom is pretty skippy, skippy. And, uh, I love the names like the names Tommy, Tommy and skippy and, um, Julie, Lauren. Uh, Julie and Lauren and Susie. yeah. And so that's, yeah, that's a whole subplot. So they have a party. Um, and again, just like in Romeo and Juliet with the masquerade ball and, um, they, oh, but the kids are all at the beach, we should say. They, so they after, the Galleria, after the Galleria, you're at the beach. And this is true that, you know, in California, at least in Southern California, certainly in those days, it didn't matter if you were like a surfer or a beach, you know, a swimmer, you were going to end up at the beach. You just, because that's just a place to hang out. It's just a place where kids can go and hang out for free. And, you know, maybe you're going in your jeans, but <laughs> right, right. But everybody goes to the beach. And if everybody is at the beach in their swimsuits, like you can only get swimsuits from so many places, especially in those days. Um, things like punk rock garb versus valley girl garb goes away. And so you don't know when you meet somebody at the beach in their swimsuit, if that's somebody who is of your crowd or not necessarily. You don't know if they're a so, goth or not, you know? No, you don't know. <laughs> so the kids are all at the beach, Nicolas Cage and Fred. Fred Cameron Die. Cameron Die. Yeah, who's great in this yes. too. Like they, their friendship, you really buy it. And um, they're at the beach and they see these cute girls and they hear that there's going to be a party. And Fred's like, oh, that's where these cute girls are going to be. We got to go there. And so they show up at the party. But then, of course, they're now in their normal clothes. And we all realize like, oh, 
you are not the same kind of, well, no, you're not what we thought you were. It's very similar to the Romeo and Juliet thing where they spot each other, but then they show up at the party and the, the, the love interests are from two different social classes and backgrounds that hate each other and hijinks ensue. Don't be afraid. What are you doing here? Do you have a death wish or something? That's what Fred said. Fred said? Never mind. You live around here? <laughs> like, this is very strange. What are you doing back here? I forgot my comb. Really now? Well, to tell you the truth, I kind of thought that maybe you and I could, um... We could what? You get out of here. <laughs> like, I don't think you'd be any more welcome down there right now. <gasps> I mean, let's leave the party. I'm so sure. <laughs> Kill. I'll meet you out front. Wait a minute. Where are we going to go? I don't care. What are we going to do? Anything. Okay. But I have to bring my best friend? That's fine. I'll be waiting for you. Cabernet, my favorite color is magenta. Hi. Hi. I'm Julie, and this is Stacy. Charmed, I'm sure. I am simply gonna freak out and die! Did you get in the car? Cud! I will pay whatever it takes to make sure nobody breathes a word of this. Like, I'll be totally bummed out if anyone on the earth outside of this car finds out about this. God, where is your sense of adventure? Just shut up. I personally guarantee you, you will have the time of your life tonight. Yes. They, they get thrown out of the party but then because he, he barely looked at her. <laughs> yeah, he looked at her and Tommy got jealous. And Tommy, by the way, is getting eaten. Lauren. Lauren. Who's drunk, takes Who's, advantage of her being Right, drunk. right. Yeah. And you should also say that at the time, they were showing, they show breasts in movies all yeah. the time, especially teen movies. They weren't even thinking about it was such how a non that was. No, just like, yeah, here's some teenagers. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing that happened a lot. A lot. And so she had to show, I think it was like four, two or three. It was a few pairs of breasts, but they didn't say how long you had to show it or what context. So she tried mm -hmm. to keep it as real as possible without being salacious. Right. Which I think she she, she does. manages. Yeah. yeah. He So Nicolas Cage and Fred, Nick, they get kicked out of the party. And then they cut Randy and Fred. They get kicked out of the party. And then Randy sneaks back to beat her. And they're, like I said, their chemistry is just when they're talking it's to really each other. It's really good. I've heard different things like they were dating, they weren't dating. I, I mean, Nicolas Cage says, oh, I had a big crush on her. She's like, oh, no, we were just friends. I don't know. But there's so much chemistry there. I'm like, they're in love. They're going to get married and have babies and they have grandchildren now and they're happy. I mean, I just, yeah. just, you get all of that from that. He takes her out and this is where I get super happy is when they're just going down the LA strip in 1982, the 83. Oh, right. I know. Come on. And they go, he takes them to the, she brings her friend along. Right. And so Fred and Fred and the friend are kind of, they're also kind of like got a little bit of a kind of a, a thing Flirty going thing. on. And a little flirty thing. And, um, you know, the Valley girls are not really sure about, like, leaving the Valley. This is maybe just a little, mm. um, he, They go to this club, which is now the Viper Room. Mm -hmm. And the band, like, it only has the best bands ever playing, like the Plimsolls. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Where these teenagers can just go and see the Plimsolls. Yeah, you could be I a guess. teenager and go to a club. <laughs> and yeah, and so he's taking mm-hmm. her. They're going down the strip. They're in this convertible. I mean, what is what is better than that? Come but, on. Come on. But I think it's Stacey it looks that great. goes with her. But Stacey's kind of a pill. Like, she doesn't like anything. She's that girl. Like, you know, she can't handle different. Whereas Julie's like, oh, this sounds fun. This is, I want to try something new. I never did this before. Never yeah. Never did this before. So they start dating. And he just takes her out. And they try different things. And that whole montage of them is just so special. And you also learn that her parents, like I said, are hippies. And they bit, pretty much are like... You do what you want to do. You you know, you need to make your own decisions. We're just here to help you out. They get a little worried when she's out all night, but then she's like, they make her have to talk about it. And she goes, why can't you just ground me like Lauren's parents? They're like, that's bad karma. We can't, we can't ground you. They, they're very, very loving people, but they let her do her thing. But they, it's a very sweet relationship that develops. God, this stuff is so gross. How could people eat that? Because it isn't greasy doesn't mean it's bad for you, Dodo. It's yuck. Yuck. It's yuck. <laughs> You're a yuck. Oh, God, I'm going to die. Julie, what are you doing? Are you all right? I'm humiliated to the max. Hi. 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 Randy, this is my dad. <laughs> Steve Richmond. What's happening, man? How's it going? Foreign. How, how you doing? Great. It's great. He wants a sandwich. All right, dude. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are you doing here? I wanted to see you. But why here? What's wrong with this place? <gasps> this place is so gross. I mean, all this stuff that tastes like nothing. It's supposed to be so good happened. for you. What about the slow? <laughs> Did you get in trouble the other night? For what? You're coming home so late. No. Wow, did your parents find out? Yeah, they were waiting up. Don't they care? For sure they care, but I'm supposed to develop into my own person, you know? <laughs> oh, well, that sounds good. How about a Coke? Uh, sorry. My dad said they supported the war effort and it rocks enzymes in your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, let's get out of here. Don't you have to work? I've got flexible hours. Mm-hmm. See you, Dad. Bye-bye, sweetie. Come up with any new gizmos? We got some new stuff. You can come by and take a look at it. Honey, where's Julie? She left with Randy. Who's Randy? I think he's that dude she was out with the other night. Do you think we should talk to her about this? The one part of the movie that doesn't work for me is that she's so concerned about her friends that she breaks up with him in order to get back with Tommy. And I'm just like, yes. why does Lauren want her to be with Tommy if she and Tommy already had a thing? Why? But she doesn't. She's if you watch, she's not going along with the other girls. She's. She's the only one who's, I mean, quietly, but she's piping up being like, well, you know, maybe you should do what you think is right. And, right. you know, maybe you should really just think about this really carefully before you run back to Tommy. Um, yeah. And and I think, I think she does. I think uh, Elizabeth Daly is such a, a great job as she's Lauren. She's very good. Because it's not an easy um, part character. She has a lot to do in this movie. And I think she handles it really well. But at the same time, I know I thought that too. And I used to think that when I was a kid, like, how could she just because her friend said, how could this is all this is their whole world is living in the valley and going to this high school. And you know how it is like if they if you are going to high school and everybody is not speaking to you and everybody's ostracizing you. That's a big it's a big deal. And she's only a junior. Yeah. Yeah, She's got one more year to go. I can. can So. So, yeah. So I can see her being swayed. In that way. And Tommy, you know, like this guy is so horrible. It's really just about his ego. He doesn't know anything about her or care about her, really. He's right. just about the fact that she's pretty and and he doesn't want people to think that she dumped him. So, so yeah, so she breaks up because – but then this has to happen. So she has to break up with, with the guy that she really likes um, because he's different. And he – 
just he is persuaded by his friend Fred, who's a good friend, to fight for her and fight for her by being there and showing up and being present and um, doing crazy romantic things. And that's another fun montage yes. of the film where, you know, he shows up at the, you know, they go to the movies, she and Tommy go to the movies and he's the ticket taker. They go to the drive-in and he's the waiter and he's putting on like different voices. And we're getting to see Nicolas Cage's a lot of range from right. Nicolas Cage in this movie um, that we've not seen in anything he's done so far. We've seen little glimpses like in Fast Times, like in Rumblefish, which he's making at the same time as this movie. Right. Like, this, those two movies come about at the same time. And he's awesome in Rumblefish, like we talked about mm -hmm. last week. But it's definitely a one kind of lane character. He's not getting to do like funny things. That he's not getting to, to show all this stuff that he gets to show in this movie. I mean, he's so good in this. It may, you know, it just made me think of, um, cause I always think of like Moonstruck. Like I love, you know, you and I both love Moonstruck. Uh, That's like one of our favorite I love movies. Moonstruck so much. It's so wonderful. And he's so great in it. And he's so like wacky and yet romantic and you could totally yes. get it. And I think it starts yeah. here. Like this oh, absolutely. Our, it as, does. You know, as an audience, yeah. like we, t we get it from here. So he's doing that funny montage and he's like, and Nicolas Cage apparently like slept in his car and he just did all these things to stay in character, which I could totally see Nicolas Cage doing. And her, she, and I love, love the talk. I love it when he meets the dad and he's, and the dad, the parents are just, the dad is, Frederick Forrest is so lovely as the father. He's so like, I just respectful love him. of her, you know, trying to teach her good values, but letting her make her own mistakes and making her. Mm -hmm. So he, the, he first, he, he's totally fine with them dating. And then when she says to him, I think I want to break up with him because everyone's going to make fun of me. And he's just like, was that really what you want to do? Is that, you know, people used to make fun of the, how I, I looked. I loved when he's looking at the pictures. It's just who's that? Because uh, that was that was before your mother. Anyway, uh, but, but, but he's, it's very very romantic and very sweet. But he's letting her make her own choices, which is what you should do. You should have your kid. They have to make their own mistakes. They have to make their own successes. That's how it it works. Then we get to the prom scene, and we have is it Josie Cotton who's singing? Josie Cotton, come on! I love Josie Cotton. She's she's so great. First of all, I want that skirt. That I, I, I want her that skirt too. that she's wearing in this. I've I've I remember seeing it in the because I saw this movie in the movie. So this movie came out. I was like ten. You know how when you're a teenager and you go out with the other teenagers and your family's like, take your little cousin so you don't get into trouble, right? Like you got to take your little cousin along. That was me. I was the little cousin that I had to go along with my with my older teenage cousins. And so I saw this in the movie theater with them. And I remember like, I want <laughs> that skirt. Even then, I was like the second I saw it, I was like, I must find it. I've never found it. I don't know where it's like a it's like a, a a pleather shiny it's somehow like a scene like a racetrack or something it's the coolest skirt ever that has ever been made and I want it and now another thing that happened in this film that I never noticed never made me laugh until this week it never really even made much of an impression on me this week let me tell you I laughed my booty <laughs> off at the teacher who was introducing oh Julie God. and Tommy. <laughs> and now, students, the moment that you've all been waiting for, the announcement of the king and the queen of Valley High. What is being king and queen all about? Is it about who wears the nicest clothes? I think not. Is it about who's dating the captain of the football team or who's seeing the head cheerleader? I don't think so. Is no. it a popularity contest? I doubt it. I'm going to give you Although the chance you never gave can't me. Help <laughs> when one is honorable, when one is disciplined, when one is school spirited. Yes, kings and queens. They don't grow on trees. All of them. Everyone can't be a king and a queen. Oh boy. No, students. Get up. I remember my prom. I wanted to be the queen. I wasn't. What are you doing, huh? What's the extreme? Who have set an example for our whole school with their behavior. 
They need no introduction. Because they are not just the king and queen of Valley High. They are Valley High. Your king, your queen. Yes. I salute you, ma'am. That she, she, chef's kiss. Just, it's like the choices in this film are right. so perfect. She, where she's going on about like, what does it mean to be, to be prom queen? Kids, you're not going to believe this, but I wanted to be queen. I wasn't. <laughs> just, she takes it so seriously, like they're so listening. seriously. And these kids are half buzzed because they like they put. They're not listening bowl, at all. Who's in the punch bowl? And they're dancing like they don't care. And yeah, she makes a big deal about introducing them. And then off screen, Nicholas Cage is having a fight with Tommy, and it's pretty great. It's very simple. This movie's like an hour and a half. They get into the. Oh, not even. Uh, right? Yeah. And then they get and they, they get out of there. And the whole thing is that Tommy had set up that the limo would take them to a hotel, and he made a reservation at a hotel. He okay. Tommy is such a jerk <laughs> that he's so terrible. He's so he's such a jerk that he has reserved a hotel room. Like he's so confident in himself, he's reserved a hotel room to take Julie to after the prom without telling her, without right. asking her. He's just done it, and um. So yeah, so he's, but but she ends up in the limo with Nicolas Cage, and the limo driver's like, "Well, should I? You're, I'm supposed to take you guys to the uh, the Sheraton. Should I? Am we still doing that?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, sounds good." <laughs> that's what taught me by this the hotel room. <laughs> and that's the movie. The end. <laughs> and, it's, and the song "I Melt with You," which a lot of these songs <sighs> I don't get tired of. I hear them no. now, and I, I the soundtrack the soundtrack is, is amazing. so amazing. It's so good. You've got Sparks. Yes. You've got Angst in My Pants and Monster of Love. I love Monster of Love. Um, of course, the Plimsolls. You've got Eyes of a Stranger. You've got a Million Miles Away. Uh, I mean, the songs Men in this work. movie, Men at Work. Yeah. Uh, oh, don't put another dime in, in the, the jukebox. jukebox. I mean, I mean oh, like, come on. It's, oh, it's so good. It's it's, like it's so lovers. great. There's just so many really great, great songs. And they didn't release a soundtrack right away because Fast Times at Ridgemont High was a double album. I remember that because I had it. Yes. And that was another like humongous, humongous. soundtrack. Humongous. So yeah. I think artists were like not so quick to just give away their songs, like to be on a soundtrack. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. had a very hard time putting the soundtrack together. It took like 10 years. <laughs> Before, but now you know. with today's technology we've got playlists that people put together That's they just right. kind of like put them all if you want to hear all of the songs that are in the movie including the ones that were not included on the soundtrack because they couldn't get the licensing you can find it um yeah it's such an awesome soundtrack and it and it's again hats off to martha coolidge she's it's the like, hero of this so the way that she's chosen which songs to they are put in the exact perfect place when we have our little subplot and i love the way she uses this subplot by the way of um because it's dumb you know the 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 like uh thing about the graduate and we yes, think skippy. she's setting it up so it looks like skippy is gonna like do it with the stepmom who's the milf right and um but no actually no that's not what happens and um you know that she picks monster of love for that segment it's just it's perfection. The choices, no notes. Just, it's just, it's, ah, it's such a great movie. The performances are so good. And the wardrobe and the houses. I knew those houses. I went to those houses. Yes. The, the, uh, so, yeah, I, it's, it was all, I just remember it all being so familiar, even at 10 years old, seeing it in the movie theater. Like, yeah, I fully know those neighborhoods. I, I know those kids. And it just holds up remarkably well just so well it has so much heart to it Mm -hmm. it really does yeah you really believe these people and you care about them yeah 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 uh yeah you're rooting for them it's it's super good it's really super good yeah all the locations dupars all of it now we have to talk briefly about this musical 
help me understand the musical. I didn't see the musical. Nor did I. I've only seen like snippets of the movie of the musical. Am I to understand it's a jukebox musical? Is that right? It's like an 80s jukebox musical. I honestly don't know very much about the movie. <laughs> me either. I know Alicia Silverstone is in the movie. Um, I know there was a remake. Yeah, that's what I'm talking oh, about. Okay. Um, yeah, it didn't come out until 2020, although they made it in like 2017. Oh, because Logan Paul is in the movie and he has his own. Oh, were there issues? Yeah. Oh. He's a YouTube personality with a lot of issues. So, yeah, it was released during COVID. So oh. I don't I don't remember. Oh, but from a little it. bit I saw about, yeah, and nobody made a hullabaloo about it. And, um, yeah, the little bit of it that I saw, it seemed to be a jukebox musical. Yeah. And it was told as a flashback. Um, but from the, the Julie has grown up. And I think she's Alicia Silverstone and she's telling her daughter, like, I understand what it's like to be young. And then she tells the whole story. Just don't just watch this. Yeah. Watch this. What's the point? <laughs> it's so good. It's so it really holds up. It's such a great time capsule of LA. It's such a great time capsule of like the early eighties in America. It, it really, it just, it covers a lot of things for me that checks a lot of boxes for me. Yep. Just same. Yeah. And I can't say I like anything better than the other. I think they're both just their own. Th when I hear Valley Girl now, I get excited because. Same. <laughs> it, listen, it's really good. It's a great you song. Know, Frank Zappa, as we said, is a super genius. The like the Tom Tom kind of drumming that's going on and the backing vocals and the, the whole thing is like so beautifully done. Anyway, he goes, are you into s and I go, oh, right. Could you, like, just picture me in, a, like, a leather teddy? Yeah, right. Hurt me, hurt me. I'm sure, no way. <laughs> he was, like, freaking me out. He called me a beastie. Yeah, of course. They both stand alone. And a lot of the stuff. Oh, I was going to say, um, I mentioned that they had the they had all of the cast, like listen to the song over and over again to try to nail the the accent. But Martha, Martha Coolidge, I can't remember if it was Martha Coolidge or if it was somebody talking about Martha Coolidge, um, said that they didn't want the movie to be just about that. Right. And so the decision was made that as the movie, as the story goes on, there's less and less of that, like, eh, grody, da, da, da. You know, there's it, it, that kind of di it gets dialed down. Like, as the story expands, the novelty gets dialed back, and which is, again, Smart. yet another amazing choice. But yeah, this song, man, I, I just, I will never forget here. I was, I was in my bedroom, it, it came on the radio. I literally froze because people are talking. I remember thinking they're playing this song. It was kind of a weird song, but it wasn't that weird. It sounded a little bit like Adamant or yeah. it has a little like a bow, wow, wow kind of a sound. And, um, and what I thought was happening, I remember what, what I thought was happening was that some, maybe that they had kept the mic on in the radio station and somebody had left. Somebody was talking over the song was what I thought was happening. And, um, and then, and it's long, it's like four minutes. Yeah, it's four and, and a something. half minutes. It's not yeah. a short song. And as it was going on, I would, me realizing like, no, this is the song. They made a song about the way we talk <laughs> because everybody I knew talked like that. Um, that is the way the kids at school talked. That is the way my cousins talked. That is the way young people talked in Southern California at that time. And it just, I remember just like being frozen and staring at the radio and, and like coming to the realization, like, no, this is the song. This is about the, this weird thing in the way that we talk that our parents are always going on about. Like, why do you talk like this? Cause our parents didn't talk that way. No, it was, totally I remember, I remember invented. the adult saying like, why are you, where, what do you mean? What are you even saying? I remember hearing adults say, 
uh, you know, because our accent, it's like this such a heightened version of us of a Southern California accent. In, in it's it's very um, today we would call it Kardashian. Yes, um, we have in Southern California, and especially in Southern California, California is a humongous state. For those of you who aren't aware, it's like two states. Um, Southern California, we do this thing where we have an I E. A E substitution in the way that we speak. So for instance, um, I would have scrambled eggs for breakfast, not eggs, eggs. Um, I would put my money in the bank, not the bank, the bank. Um, I would sleep with my head on a pillow. So we have, it's a, it, that, so that vowel thing gets like the way kids do, you know, you take the language and you make it your own and it gets exaggerated and exaggerated until the adults have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, it was amazing. And, and then to have the brilliance, I mean, I don't know how, cause I said, I don't know what the story was and how Martha Coolidge got assigned to this film, but some brilliant person, you know, there was a lot of stars that aligned and I she got it's... placed in the right place at right. the right time and turned this into this thing that we're still talking about today. People love this movie. It's, and it really holds up well. And I should say that, you know, Frank Zappa sued and lost and I yeah, he lost he lost so I always wonder you know what he if he ever saw it or if Moon ever saw it, what they thought of it I wonder if they but he like I said he was such a control freak he would never just sign on to something you know there's certain people like Kiss will sign anything and make a Kiss thing like a Kiss coffin a Kiss whatever <laughs> right sure Zappa would never do that that was not how he did yeah I got the impression and I and I I really am interested in reading her book but I got the impression from from moon that um they had enough money you oh, know yeah. that he didn't need to be he didn't need to be chasing uh and, and you can see it in the and not that he would anyway but you can see it in the in the marketing that they did for this song that like he didn't need to market this song. <laughs> he didn't, she didn't need to be on solid gold. They just kind of did it for a, a goof. And um, yeah, he didn't need to be like selling film rights to a song because he didn't have to. So why should he? So he can be a hard ass about it. Um, so yeah, I get it, you know, but um, grateful for it. I'm grateful too. It's, it's an excellent song. It's super well done. And I love this movie and the movie would not exist without the song. So thank you to everybody involved. Yes. Um, it just, this hog, this whole thing just makes my heart so happy. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Well, please, you know, reach out to us all the places we mentioned at the top of the show with your ideas. We're always looking for them. It could be a, a, a book, short story, magazine article, a song. Once again, our email is book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. And please be sure to subscribe and leave a few stars. Should you feel you'd like to do that for us? That would be amazing. Uh, Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media call outs are at she's not your mama. And where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter while well, that still exists at Brooklyn Margo. Uh, it's Brooklyn Fitchick for my Instagram, for my threads, and that's the name of my site. And then on TikTok, I'm at Margo Donahue, and I put some clips from Valley Girl there and also Moon and Frank being interviewed. So check that out. All right, everyone. Oh, next week we're going to be covering The Killers, which is a short story by Ernest Hemingway, and it's a movie starring, is it Burt Lancaster or it's Amy yes, Gardner and Burt yes. Lancaster? classic film we're very excited to talk about that yeah and we haven't talked about him since uh what's the if they if you build it they will come he was in that oh uh, uh, uh field field of dreams field, field of dreams yes and have we ever talked about ernest hemingway i don't think we have i think this is gonna be I'm our first not hemingway. sure we have that's awesome okay cool yeah so that's gonna be coming I'm up sorry, it's totally tubular cool. <laughs> i'm a val i know <laughs> All right, everybody. You've been awesome. I still say awesome. <laughs> Same. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Book versus Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags LadyPodSquad and Pottering Family. 
If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and look for Book Versus Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book Versus Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book Versus Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.